Thanks for joining me for episode 31 of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. This is the eighth episode of season two, and I'll be joined by Jornay Armand to talk about video creation, tools for connecting our students to the whole learning community, including family members and industrial professionals. We'll talk about Flipgrid, but we'll also touch on Seesaw, WeVideo, Adobe Spark, some screencasting tools, and more, plus some exciting announcements. You're going to have to stay tuned to find out all about it. Here we go. Hi, I'm Dan Krinas, host of the Leader of Learning podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Hello, duct tapers. This is your buddy, Jake Miller. It feels so good to be back in front of the microphone today. I've missed this. I've missed this connection. I've missed you. (laughs) It's funny. It's only been two weeks, which is the normal gap between episodes, but I feel like I've had so much going on in the last few weeks that I've been kind of disconnected from the duct tape community, so it's exciting to get back at it with a new episode today. I think I'm feeling actually a little extra excited today and talking a little extra fast, probably, too, because I'm excited about some new stuff that I have to share with you. So let me dive right into those exciting announcements. First off, this past weekend at the Teach Better 19 conference here in Ohio, I did my first ever live recordings of interviews for the show. I've decided that I'm going to release one tiny little mini live recorded interview in each of the weeks between my normal episodes. So there'll be five to 10 minute long chats with somebody that I met at one of these conferences. So far, they're all from the Teach Better conference, but we'll see if you guys enjoy these. I'll keep doing them at future conferences too. Uh, There won't be the normal soapbox moment. There won't be the normal updates on my speaking schedule or the favorite tweets at the end or things from the Flipgrid or even a game with the guest. It'll just be one educational duct tape question that I'll go over with whoever that guest is that I happen to grab at the conference. I'm super excited to start off with two people that I really, really respect in the educational community, and you guys are going to love it. My first two are Adam Welcome and Tara Martin. So next week on November 20th, you will see a short episode appear in your feed, assuming you're subscribed. If you're not, go do that now. Go subscribe so you don't miss it. Anyhow, November 20th, Adam Welcome, me, educational duct tape, five to 10 minutes, chit chat, fun, subscribe. Now I'm going to say sentences that aren't just one word long. (laughs) I did, I think, seven of these little interviews. So they'll come out every other week over the next 14 weeks. So Adam will be in the feed on November 20th, and then November 27th or whatever it is will be a regular episode. And then seven days later, whatever it is, December 3rd or whatever, will be the Tara Martin episode. And then seven days later will be a regular episode. And then seven days after that uh, will be whoever's next from those interviews I did. Speaking of November 20th, the date that that Adam Welcome episode will come out, that's also the day of our next hashtag EDU duct tape Twitter chat. These have been so much fun. Meet us on Twitter at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every other Wednesday to talk about the most recent full episode. I don't plan at this point to chat about the mini episodes, just the full ones. We'll see if that changes in the future. But for right now, it's every other week. So next Wednesday, November 20th, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitter. Join us. We have a lot of fun and we grow as learners and we share some exciting things. I love getting to hear from the duct tapers that join us there. By the way, if you've never done a Twitter chat before, check in the show notes. There's a link to last week's um, you know, highlights so that you can see kind of how it went. And then there's also a link to a guide to how to do Twitter chats. That'll help you out too. And then you know, just you can even just come in and kind of lurk and just watch the chat happen if you want to. We really, really, really want to hear from you. Now, if you happen to not be a Twitter person, we also discuss these same questions in the Facebook group. So there's also a link to the Facebook group in the show notes. If you don't do either of those, I I don't know what to do. (laughs) You don't have to, but those are the two places that we're chatting about the episodes. Um, Maybe you're just chatting uh, chatting about it around the water cooler or the coffee machine or something like that, or with your Starbucks barista. Who knows? (laughs) Jake, you're getting off track here. Next big announcement. This is a big one. This is what I'm excited about. Certificates of listening, laughing, and learning. I'll give you a moment to try and guess what that might be. If you guess that I'm going to send listeners certificates that they can at least attempt <laughs> attempt to submit for professional development uh, credit, you guessed right. So after you listen to this episode, you'll head to eduducttape.com, E-D-U-D-U-C-T-T-A-P-E dot com slash certificate and enter the super secret password. 
password that I provide later in this episode so that you can get a certificate sent to you. Now, I've got to be honest, this is the first time I'm trying this. I've, I've never done this with a podcast. It's very realistic that some of you are going to take this to your administrations or your employers, whoever it is, and they're going to laugh and say, no, we're not giving you credit for listening to a podcast. I think they should. I don't know. I can't guarantee that they will. It's worth trying. And if they don't, then you could have a discussion with them about how much you're learning, about why maybe you should be getting credits for it. So that, that's the first thing. I, I can't guarantee you're going to get credit for it. The second thing is I can't guarantee technologically this is going to work okay. I think it's going to be fine. So what I've done is I've set up a Google form that edu.ducttape.com slash certificate will direct you to. You'll fill out that form and then Autocrat, the forms add-on or the sheets add-on actually, will automatically send you a certificate of, of your listening as a PDF that you could submit. I think it'll work fine. If it doesn't, just email me and I'll help you out. One thing, a little note here, a little kind of like behind the curtain note here. I thought about having the Google form have a secret code that you had to type in to be able to submit it, uh, like people tend to do with digital breakouts. But truth be told, those can be broken. <laughs> digital breakouts can be broken. Because if you look at the uh, the elements of a web page, you could tell what uh, code that that box is is expecting. So I didn't do that because I want to try to keep the integrity of this process. So what I've done is you'll have to type in the super secret code. You won't know for sure if you've got it right or wrong. You, you'll have to know that it's right. And as long as it's right, Autocrat will generate the form that's sent out to you, the cert- certificate that's sent out to you. If you typed in the wrong code, the certificate will not be generated. So that's how I've got it set up. Instead of the form checking for you to have the right word typed in there, because that can be, you know, kind of broken into and you cheat on it. I've set up Autocrat to do that. And I think that's completely secure. I don't think there's any way that you could see what Autocrat is looking for in there. So you'll type in the code. Hopefully you type it in and spell it correctly. And then it'll automatically generate that form to you. If you don't receive it, then email me because either A, you typed in the wrong thing or B, something's wrong. Hopefully it's not something's wrong. Anyhow, we'll see how this whole thing goes. I really don't know what to expect from it. I, my guess is it's going to go really well and that people are going to appreciate it. My goal is to reward you for the time that you're putting in trying to grow as educators. I think you deserve to get credit for this. I know some schools already give credit for listening to podcasts, but I want to kind of formalize the procedure a little bit for you. Okay, That actually segues really well into my next point. This is going to be a lot of work for me, to, to be honest, because I've got to go in and I've got to add additional uh, scripts to that form, you know, autocrat scripts, to look for the secret codes from the next episode and the next episode, the next episode, the next episode. So every episode I do, I'm going to have to go in there and make it do that. And also, these certificates that are being generated are taking space in my drive. And I don't have a, a school domain right now. I, I have just a Gmail. So it's taking up space in a drive where I pay for additional space. So it's extra time and it's taking up extra space in my drive. I think it's worth it because because I want to help you help children and I think that this will help you. And so I'm doing it like just to be helpful. Like I, I really want this to help you. But please know that there is a lot of you know work costs and financial costs to me doing this stuff that I'm doing here to try to benefit you. And I don't want your money. I'm like, please don't turn around and give me your money. But I do want you to know <laughs> that what I, I, I'm doing some other things to try to bring in some money to offset these costs. I, I don't want you to donate money to me. Please don't try to do that. But I'm doing some other things that help with that. So I have become an affiliate for Shake Up Learning. Many of you probably already follow the work of Casey Bell. She's on the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. She blogs at Shake Up Learning. She's written a wonderful Wonderful book titled Shake Up Learning. And she also has her own podcast of her own. And she's just fantastic. And she does these Google certification courses that I've heard a lot of positive feedback from people who have used them to help them go get Google certified or get their Google certified trainer. These courses prepare people for them. I know some people who have gotten their certifications without using her courses, but for other people who need some assistance, I've heard great reviews on her courses. She also offers some other courses on Google Classroom and Google Slides and dynamic learning and some other stuff. So anyhow, I'm kind of losing my point here. I have become an affiliate for Casey. So that means I have a special link in the show notes where if you're interested in one of Casey's courses and you use one of those links, you pay the same amount that you would have paid otherwise, but I get a little percentage of it. It's it's not me being greedy. I hope you don't think I'm I'm crazy for doing this. I I know asking for money is kind of faux pas in education. I'm just trying to offset the costs of the things that I am doing, you know, by having a website, by having a podcast. These aren't free for me to provide for you. I want you to receive them for free. And this is a way for me to do that. So if you're interested in any of Casey's courses, you can go to my affiliate link, which is check this out, guys. I'm so proud of this link bit.ly slash Jake up learning. Get it, Jake? That's me. I'm Jake. <laughs> Good stuff. Bit.ly slash J A K E U P 
learning, L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G. You can also access that link in the show notes, but that's just for if you're interested in some of Casey's courses that she provides, which I've heard great things about, and I, I follow Casey and I listen to Casey's podcast. I've seen Casey speak. She's phenomenal. She provides great resources. If you're already interested in what she's doing, use that link and it'll give me a little benefit. If you're not interested, it's okay. It's okay. It's totally okay. Uh, but those are my new announcements for today. So we've got the certificates of listening, laughing, and learning. We've got the new mini live recorded episodes coming up starting next week and we've got me being an affiliate for shake up learning let's see what else do we have to talk about with the duct tapers today well i should mention that today i'm joined by jornay armont she shares some really awesome stuff you're gonna love it next up let's check in on my calendar next week i will be doing a mini keynote at the wviz idea stream technology and learning conference in downtown cleveland next friday will be the first of two full day workshops based off of educational duct tape at kent state university the second of those two dates is on december 6th full day workshops you think that an hour-long podcast is an experience i mean <laughs> experience i'm not sure if that's the right word uh try a full day of educational duct tape i can cannot wait. It's going to be fun. The November 22nd one is going to be a full day workshop where attendees learn about educational duct tape and then identify a problem, need, or goal of their own to focus on. Then with my help, they're actually going to learn how to address it. And then they'll get to put in the time to address it with my support and with the support of the people around us. This is really the way that professional development should work, right? Teachers should identify their needs in their classroom, what's going to benefit them and their learners, and then get the chance to do it. And that's what we're going to do that could be a little bit intimidating for teachers to say, like, what do you want to do and what are you going to use to do it? So I think the educational duct tape, like decision making protocol and message that I've been sharing throughout the podcast is really going to help these people. So that's what we're doing that day. I'm really, really psyched to see how it goes. Uh, the December 6th date then focuses for the full six hours on innovative uses of Flipgrid. We're going to hit everything from grid pals to Flipgrid AR to like, I'm not going to list it here. It's you got to come to the session to see it. Like we're in like six hours hours. That, my friends, is going to be tons of fun, too. Okay, continuing with my calendar on December 7th, I'll be one of four educators sharing in a free online webinar about educational technology. I'm first at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. That's 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for me. I'm not sure if being first means I'm like the opener, like I'm the lesser act of all four, or if it means like I'm right there when everybody's ready to you know, like get woken up and like I'm going to yell at everybody about educational technology, or I, I don't know what it means, but that's when I'll be there. And I'll be doing my hackaroni and cheese session. It's a fun one. If you've never uh, seen that session, it's a good chance for you to see it for free online in your PJs, sipping a cup of coffee. After me is Tisha Poncio sharing about her work with digital citizenship. I met uh, Tisha down at TCCA down in, in Texas a, a month or so ago, and she was telling me all about this stuff, and it's really awesome. So I, I would recommend that session if you're interested in doing some digital citizenship stuff in your school. After her is Tamara Ferguson. And Tamara, I apologize if it's Tamara or... Tamara, I, I'm not sure you're just Fergie. That's your Twitter handle for me. I've, I've never said your first name out loud. I apologize. <laughs> Anyhow, she's going to be talking about editing and sharing instructional videos the easy way. It sounds like an awesome presentation. And then after her is one of the most popular educational duct tape guests of all time, Mr. Tony Vincent, doing a session called Visual Revamp. This event is provided by the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District in Texas, but is 100% free for anyone to attend. That's December 7th. Join Details are in the show notes. More calendar stuff in January. I'll be in Castleberry, Texas. I'll be spending Valentine's Day with teachers in Revere Schools in Ohio. I will be at WitCon in Illinois in June. There's also an event in March that hasn't been announced yet, and one in July that the ink hasn't quite dried on the contract just yet, so I'll share that one in two weeks. Uh, and that does it for my calendar for now, so you know what time it is. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just grab my soapbox from over here. Uh, uh, yeah. There we go. That's yeah, perfect. Climb up on there. So I've got a little confession to make. I've lied to everyone that has ever seen me present about educational duct tape. So I tell this story about when I realized my students were not watching my instructional videos. It's a good story. It always gets some laughs, but I tell a lie in it. You could hear the story back in episode 11 of this podcast, but let's talk about the lie. You see, I say that I solved the problem that problem about the videos with Edpuzzle. And well, that's just not true. Edpuzzle came out right around the same time as the event from the story. And well, I wasn't aware of Edpuzzle yet. So I used a different tool. That tool was called Zaption. 
I have to be honest, I liked Zaption better than I like Edpuzzle. So in case you don't know Edpuzzle, it's a tool that allows you to embed questions into videos and get some formative assessment data out of the video amongst a few other features. Now, Zaption did pretty much the same thing, but with two key bonuses. Number one, you could combine multiple videos in Zaption. And number two, you could have the viewer jump to different spots in the video based on their answers. So yeah, I loved those features. So when I said I used Edpuzzle, it was a lie. I did solve the problem with a tech tool, but it was an Edpuzzle. So why do I say Edpuzzle each time? Well, Zaption went away. It got purchased by a company and became something else and is no longer available for use. So as a speaker, it just doesn't make sense to say, I used to use X, but now I use Y because X no longer exists. So I just jumped straight to saying, I use Y. It just works better in a speech. So when Zaption went away, though, I was super bummed, like really, really bummed. Some of you could probably commiserate with me on that. I mean, I was super frustrated. So I had to pick an alternative. There was Edpuzzle or Educanon, which is now called PlayPosit. Edpuzzle won, at least for me. So it's what I went with. And, and I love Edpuzzle. I really do. I'm, I'm super happy with it. I just miss Zaption. So this brings me to my soapbox moment for the week. And it's a question. What do we do when a tech tool goes away? What do you do when Zaption goes away? When Recap goes away? When Google Reader is taken down? What about today's Meet? What about the Snagit Chrome extension or Oregon Trail or the original Carmen Sandiego or Goo.gl or Google Docs Story Builder or Picasa or... <laughs> I don't know. I asked this question on Twitter and people had so many different ideas, so many different things. They were sad, went away. What do we do when those things go away? What do we do when Movie Maker is gone or 10 Marks or TAC or Orasma or Infuse Learning or Stupaflix? The ability to filter a Google search by reading level. TLDR Chrome extension. The National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. What do we do? Well, the first thing is that you have my permission to be bummed out. You deserve it. It's frustrating. A workflow that you had, a solution that you used is gone. Hours spent learning to use it and putting it to use now feel wasted. It's, it's a true first world problem, but you have my blessing to mourn it. But then what? Well, now it's time to put educational duct tape to use. First, think about your verb. What's your goal? But then also, and this is the step we tend to skip, also reflect on the tool that you used to use. What did it do well? What could it have done better? Was it as effective as it could have been? Or was it just good enough? It's possible that you've trusted a tool for years and haven't reflected on its effectiveness. Trust me, I've been there, I've done it, but we need to reflect on it before we jump right to finding a replacement. Because there's a good chance that if it was the best tool two or three years ago, there may be an even better solution out there now. And it may not be a one-for-one -one substitution for what you used to use. It may be even better. This might actually be a blessing in disguise. And it might be a totally different tool. I went from Zaption to Edpuzzle, and they're, for the most part, the same tool serving the same purpose. But maybe you do something totally different. Maybe you break the video up on the slides in Google Slides and then use Pear Deck or Nearpod to ask kids questions between segments. Maybe you play the video for a whole class and ask them to have a back channel chat on YoTeach or backchannelchat.com during it. Maybe you post the video in Flipgrid and have kids respond with video of their own. You couldn't do that in Zaption. Maybe you have the kids watch the video and then create their own remake of it. You definitely couldn't do that in Zaption. Or maybe you just use Edpuzzle like I did. Any of these answers can be the right one, but you've got to pick the one answer that meets your goals. You've got to reflect on your why, your verb, what you're trying to achieve, and then you can identify your noun. So first, what was the verb? Second, what did the old noun do well? What was it missing? And now, third, find your new noun. But you may just find that your needs have changed. Check yourself. Is that verb still important to you? Is it still a goal that you have? Can it be combined with other goals that you have? Be deliberate about this decision. Not only does the technology tool landscape change over the course of a few years since you first started using that old tool, but so does your mindset about education and instruction about what you know works best for your students. Your goals may have totally changed. 
Or maybe they haven't, and maybe you just need to find a replacement tool. But it's important to think about it. It's worth it, right? You'll likely use whatever tool or noun or strategy that you end up choosing for years to come if you choose right. So it's worth taking your time to think it through. Now, let's jump into our interview with Jornay Armand. Today's guest. All right, today our guest is Jornay Armand. Jornay, an educator for over 16 years and current educator innovation lead at Flipgrid, is committed to supporting educators in innovative learning experiences. She focuses on continuous improvement, has a zest for learning for life, and is on a mission to empower every voice with her team at Flipgrid. You can track down Jornay on Twitter at Savvy underscore educator or reach out to her at Jornay, that's J-O-R-N-E-A, at Flipgrid.com or track her down on the Flipgrid.com website. Site. Jornay, thanks for being here. I am so glad to be here, Dave. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. So I, I first, I think, came into contact with you a couple years ago, maybe for the first, what do you guys call it? The Mar- your March Madness at Flipgrid? What do you guys call that thing? Uh, Flipgrid App Smash Madness. Yeah. And so you've, is it, has it been two years or three years? Yes, it's been two years since we've uh, started Flickered App Smash Madness, and it has been so incredible. I'm all about innovation and uh, thinking outside of the box. We shouldn't contain ourselves to those boxes. And so we truly believe at Flipgrid that with all these educational technology tools, we are better together. And so this is where we have educators from all around the world sharing ways that they can use multiple tools to serve a specific purpose or need or a fun challenge for their students in a very creative way. So it was great having you there. That was the first time I learned how to do stop motion slide animations uh, with Jake Miller. So uh, yeah. really appreciate you joining our fun with Flipgrid Ask Smash Madness. Yeah, I'm a two-time loser on Flipgrid App Smash Madness, but we're all we're all winners, aren't we? We're all winners <laughs> because now educators all over the world have access to those innovative ideas, things that maybe they would not have thought about on their own. So the whole joy in this is that we all win because we all continuously improve. And that was one of my uh, commitments, right? So we'll keep it going. Hopefully every year it just gets better and better. I've already been scoping out some people. I've been seeing try some things out on Twitter for our next F Smash Madness. So I know once again, it's just going to be great with all of the new Flipgrid updates. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that happens in March, and we'll be sure to maybe link in some of the past app smashes into the show notes so people can check those out and see what it's all about. Um, you know, but that kind of brings me to a point with having you on the show. You're the first person that I've had on the show who works for one of these ed tech companies that we're talking about. And at, at first, I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe it's kind of a slippery slope to have somebody on that works with one of the companies that we're talking about. But I think what you just said there is a perfect reason why, why I should, like why you should be on the show, because you guys aren't just out there like working for a company trying to to promote your company. Like you're trying to improve things that are happening in classrooms. You're trying to help educators do fun and exciting things that are efficient and engaging and effective for their students. And it's not just about your tool, because in those app smashes, you're talking about app smashing, you know, Flipgrid with Google Slides or with a Microsoft tool or with OneNote or with Seesaw or with like all of these different tools. So it really is an education focused thing, right? Absolutely. You know, when I joined the team a couple of years ago as the only educator on the team, it was, you know, truly eye opening. I think for for both parties because I really didn't understand how ed tech companies work. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I am an educator, but what I did understand was best practices. And yeah. I, um, in my former role, I was able to support twelve school districts with their implementation of technology through professional development. And of course, you know. Those of you who are in that line of work, you know the importance of not only sharing uh, what a tool is there for, but innovative ways that you can use it to enhance your current curriculum, to spark new thinking for your students, um, embed creativity and design thinking, all those wonderful things that we talk about in education. And so this was a great way for me to not only uh, share the beauty of Flipgrid because I love yeah. Flipgrid ever since the first time I had ever used it, um, but to also be a support 
for fellow yeah. educators. We are all here in this helping role. And so I just, you know, open myself out there for any educator who's out there and they're wondering, you know, how can I best use Flipgrid in my seventh grade math class or in my mm -hmm. kindergarten class? Reach out to us. That's what we're here for as a support, mm -hmm. as a thinking partner. Um, so we're 100 percent here for you and to empower everything that you do in the classrooms every single day. Yeah, I love that. And what you're really saying there is very educational duct tapey. You're, you know, you're saying like taking what you're doing in your classroom, taking your style as an educator, your content you're teaching, your kids that you're teaching, and what you're trying to achieve for those kiddos and finding a use of an ed tech tool to, to meet that need. And Flipgrid is such a flexible tool for doing some of those things. All right. So now that we've, we've chatted about some of that, that Flipgrid stuff, let's, let's have a little bit of fun before we dive into the educational duct tape. So we're going to play a game. You up for a game? I'm up for a game. Let's do it. Which of these things do you consider to be less torturous? Okay, so we're going to play a game of which of the following is less torturous. It goes by a, a more popular name commonly, but due to copyright infringement, I'm not allowed to say the, the real name of this game. It's a much simpler name, but I, I have to call it which of the following is less torturous. So I'm going to say two, two phrases, and you're going to tell me which of the following would be less torturous to you. So first off, which of the following is less torturous? Being fantastic at flying a plane or amazing at driving a monster truck. So neither of those would be torturous, yeah. but which one would be less torturous? So which one would you be more excited to have? Being fantastic at flying a plane or amazing at driving a monster truck? A fantastic at flying a plane. Yeah, me too. Where would you go? Everywhere. Um, Bali would probably be my first place to go. Yeah. Because have you been before? No, I have not. It's on that bucket list. Um, but I yeah. just flying in and over, it would just be the most gorgeous scene ever. Um, yeah. so definitely. And the monster truck thing, I'm, I'm afraid of trucks, even the trucks with the really big wheels, um, <laughs> that come next to me. I'm like, no, nope, I can't do that. That would be really torturous for me. But you would be the one with the really big wheels. You, you, everybody else would be scared of you. No, but I couldn't even sit up in that big thing. No, I can't. Yeah. You need like a ladder to get up there and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, can do it. I see you. You pulling in the the Flipgrid uh, offices, the the headquarters in your. Um, it would be like a a a, a bright bright green. <laughs> monster truck with with flip grid all over it and, and hashtag student voice on the side of it right yeah i guess that would be like the next step for bus tours right <laughs> monster truck. right instead of instead of your guys's bus tours you could be on a, on a monster truck that's perfect <laughs> I could totally see these videos on Twitter of you guys riding around in your monster truck. This might be something you guys actually have to do. Yeah, you know what? I almost can kind of see that too. <laughs> <laughs> We're up for anything. You never know with the Flipgrid team. <laughs> I, I, could, I can imagine a particular staff member uh, riding on the back of the monster truck in, in some short shorts and having some fun back there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so now a little, little bit more ed tech. Which of the following would be less torturous? Having to listen to all of your music on a Walkman. Remember the old Walkman cassette tapes? And I used to okay. love it. <laughs> right. Or having to take all of your pictures on a digital camera. So you can't use your phone for either of those two things now. Which would be less torturous? Having to listen to all of your music on a Walkman or having to take all of your pictures on a digital camera? I think less torturous. Yeah. Would be the Walkman. I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm thinking because, you know, it took a while with the cassette to get through side one before having to flip to side B. Right. <laughs> so it, it wouldn't put forth much effort. But I think, you know, with the camera, you know, the digital ca and I, I went through a couple of digital cameras this weekend, like, oh, I don't need this anymore. Uh, yep. Just the number of steps, you know, um, with the digital camera, using the SD card and, you know, 
Oh, that's right. Did you imagine you'd like go out to dinner or whatever? You want to take a picture of your food that you had and you want to share it with everybody. So you got to go home. You've got to hook up the USB cord to the computer, right? And you've got to upload the picture. You got to wait for it to pull into iPhoto. And then you've got to export it out of iPhoto. And then you've got to post it to your social media site. That just seems like a hassle. Like I'm, I'm going to be listening to my Walkman and I'm going to take selfies on my phone of myself doing it. And I used to love it back in 2003, you know, in my class, yeah. we had the big digital cameras with the floppy disk. You know, right? Even- yeah, with the, with the screen on it. Yeah, I totally remember that. It was like it was like one megapixel or something. That was so sort of innovative then, you know. But um, but yeah, I couldn't do it now. No way. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going with the Walkman, and I'm going to get my old Bon Jovi cassette. I'm gonna pop it right in there. <laughs> or maybe maybe um, the original Fresh Prince of Be- or not Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That wasn't the, the tape. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Maybe I'll put that one in. <laughs> I'll be ro- sure. you know, rolling around with my cassette player. That sounds pretty cool. I might have to try this out. <laughs> I was a huge Mariah Carey fan, so I know for sure I had Mariah Carey cassette tapes. So <laughs> Yeah, but you'd get to the end of Vision of Love, and then you'd want to hear it again, and you'd have to rewind back through it. And if there was another song before it, you'd actually end up like partway into that song. <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't really do that much then. I've listened through as yeah. much as possible, you know? I think right. now convenience yeah let's you know on replay you know put, put vision of love on repeat <laughs> <laughs> that's like a totally different mariah carey than mariah carey now like it's not even the same person anymore I don't even talk about that <laughs> mariah carey oh mariah mariah is probably listening to the show mariah is a huge fan of educational technology and now she's offended that i've, I've told her she's she's uh changed from her we always will we've got you back <laughs> <laughs> We're here, Mariah. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, so let's do some actual educational duct tape now. Educational duct tape for any new listeners that are, that are out there is my goofy metaphor that educational technology is at its best when it's being used as a tool to help us solve a problem or meet a goal or fill a need or address a learning standard in the classroom, just like duct tape is at its best when it's being used as a tool to solve problems. We don't just set forth to use duct tape. We set forth to solve a problem and duct tape often is the tool we're using. Same with ed tech. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Okay. So this first question is an audience submitted question. Uh, I feel like I'm serving this one up really, really easily for you here, Jornay. This one came from an audience member, and the question was, what are some good video creation tools for kids under the age of 13? I want everybody listening right now to pause the podcast and try to guess what Jornay is going to say here as her answer. Go ahead. What are some good video creation tools for kids under the age of 13? Let me think about that one. What is it? hmm. It's Flipgrid, of course. <laughs> and of course it is favorite video creation tool for kids under the age of 13 and let me tell yeah. you why number one students do not need accounts with flipgrid only the educator needs to have an account with flipgrid the students just get a code to be able to join and when they're in a microsoft or google school environment they authenticate with their email domain. And so it provides a very safe environment for students to be able to create their videos. And what I love about that is that our world right now is very social and students are creating videos on various apps, whether they should be or not, um, depending on the age. But this is a great way from early learners and and to people PhD and beyond to be able to use video um, and learn how to use video and connect with other people in a positive and safe environment. So I, I truly believe with the use of Flipgrid, especially with our earliest learners, that they would also become better digital citizens um, because they had a positive firsthand experience with using video in a social learning type of manner. Um, So uh, that's one big reason why I absolutely love Flipgrid Mm -hmm. for students under the age of 13. And when they create those videos, they have access to all sorts of creativity tools right inside of that camera. So we focus on the importance of voice, but part of voice is 
being creative in how you want to share your voice. And so Mm -hmm. every student's videos look different and sound different. And that's so beautiful because we truly believe that with Flipgrid, our mission is for students to um, feel comfortable in sharing their voice, but also to respect the diverse voices of others. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that mission is accomplished every day uh, when teachers choose to use uh, Flipgrid in their classrooms. Mm-hmm. And so with this new Flipgrid camera, I, I see it as a digital storytelling uh, tool um, when I look at this camera. Because now, although you can still do those quick videos that kind of have a social media feel and everything else, um, your students, as they're creating their projects or their performances and their reflections or experiments, they can tell their story and share their ideas now by creating their videos, but also trimming and rearranging their video clips. Um, So what's really nice about this, that students can be very creative and innovative when it comes to those options. Um, I've seen students take video throughout a process and then rearrange those clips to go backwards in backwards order, Mm -hmm. which is like mind blowing, right? Um, We also have added uh, features such as whiteboard mode where you can open up a whiteboard or a blackboard and add in images and text and inking to be able to make your thinking visible. So at least with this digital whiteboard, students can capture their thinking there. They can add multiple segments to their thinking, add their voice to their thinking, and then it becomes kind of like a landing page for other students to be able to learn from one another and continue the conversations, challenge one another's thinking. Um, So I absolutely love the whiteboard mode. And then it also provides that that safe space for those students who may not want to be seen. Um, That's one way they can just kind of mask themselves. Um, In addition to that, we have filters such as warm and cool, but we also have pixel mode. Um, And so I absolutely love the pixelated um, mode because number one, if you don't want to be seen, that's a great feature. Um, But then you can also use it um, for like instructional purposes. Let's say you had a topic about guess who, right? Mm -hmm. Or guess what? Um, Students can share those ideas and then it promotes um, speaking and listening standards. Um, And then students can reveal either who or what they were talking about. Um, So there's so many different ways that you can utilize those features for your educational purposes. Um, In addition to that, you can now overlay your photos from your camera roll and then also emojis and stickers onto your video. So when you're working in class and you have that student created project or diagram, you can have that right there in your video, right next to that student's face as they're talking to be able to explain. And so um, I absolutely love this because I know teachers, you know, use uh, diagrams and uh, graphic organizers a lot. Um, This is a great way to be able to have that up there. Students can add their uh, their text right to it and explain their thinking process. Um, So that way you see the visual and hear the student's voice all at the same time. Yeah, I love I love that response, and you're you're absolutely right. And it's it's not I mean, it's 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 an easy answer for you to say Flipgrid, but it's also a correct answer because I mean it is a phenomenal tool for video uh, in the classroom. Can you clarify something for me though? This is a, qu- a question that I'm just I'm just wondering. I'm trying to remember in my head. So you mentioned the no student accounts necessary, and you mentioned that you can authenticate with Microsoft or Google uh, domains. If I send it out to a group of students and I give them a code, do they still authenticate with their domain? I can't remember if they do with their email. I mean, they would authenticate if you choose that as your grid type. So with Flipgrid now, um, after we were acquired by Microsoft it made Flipgrid 100% free for everyone to use. And we add Mm -hmm. three different, um, grid types for your community. So the first, Mm -hmm. um, grid access type will be your school email domain. Now, what's nice okay. about this, you don't have to limit it to one domain. So although, you know, maybe in your school or district you have one domain, but if it's educators um, who are connecting their classrooms to another district or across mm-hmm. the world, 
the educator who owns that grid can add multiple domains for access. Okay, so it still provides that safe environment. You just add in the domains that you want to be able to access that grid and they will authenticate. Mm -hmm. The second grid right. access type is for uh, student IDs. Now, this is primarily for um, learning environments that may not have um, that access with an account with um, Microsoft or Google. Um, a lot of our early learning um, centers are using this grid access type because you can set up student IDs for every student. You can upload CSV to make it very, a CSV file to make it very easy to add in all of your students. And um, a code will be generated for them in which you can print out just a little QR code for them to be able to scan and that gets them right in. Or you can also set up um, even two letter um, ID name. So uh, like, for example, for, for my young daughter, I have a grid set up for them and that's the domain access that I chose for them. Uh -huh. And so uh, they just type in their initials and now they have access into that grid. Uh -huh. and so I, I absolutely love that for, you know, my young children, because obviously I don't have a domain for them right. to be able to use, you know, for personal purposes. Um, right. And so then our third grid access type is our public PLC grid. Now, um, this grid is primarily for people who are over that age, um, mm -hmm. between, or 13 or 16, depending on where in the world you live. Um, and this will allow access to a grid without putting in that domain, but they would still authenticate with whatever email address they have access to. Um, now, for uh, many of our educators that are um, doing everything that they can to create those authentic learning experiences for students and connect them with other people around the world, um, some educators are choosing to um, open their topics, specific topics, to others to connect. So whether that's families, maybe it's a special author visit, maybe it's veterans, it could be any special guest. Um, we do have something called guest mode. And when an educator turns on guest mode on a topic, a special link is generated specifically for the guest. Um, to have access and they do not need to authenticate in any way with that guest code that the educator has generated. Um, Perfect. So if I want like parents to respond or if I want a professional somewhere out there, you know, like a scientist or something or other to, to be able to respond, I just have to give them a code. It doesn't matter what kind of email account they have. It's not going to connect them back to that email in any way. If they don't want it to, they just type in the code and they're in, right? Exactly. That's perfect. It's special code for them. So um, so there are so many different ways you can access Flipgrid. But, you know, first, in, uh, our priority is to keep students safe. Um, so we highly recommend, you know, that student school email domain option if that is what your schools um, have. And the most schools in the world have those access now. Have that, yeah. now. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah. And what I love about the domain part is now that opens up, and I mentioned on a previous episode that my, is it my.flipgrid.com, I believe, yes. uh, where you can go and see all your recordings. So by doing that, by using that domain, it kind of keeps it categorized for the kids that they can go back and see all of their videos. And how cool, like five years from now to be able to go back and see all of their videos from, you know, multiple school years of them responding to different prompts and things like that. And so it's all kind of housed. Uh, right in there. And, and as you said, it's just the, the ease of use uh, goes down to, to the littlest of kids, you know, can, can use it and, and, and have fun with it. A lot about that, Jake, when I was going through some of my daughter's old work, you know, that they would bring home. And I have these mm -hmm. binders of just like stuff, you know, but to say that a, a child can go to my.flipgrid.com and they can have access to all of the grids that they ever participated mm -hmm. in. You may forget, you know, what was that grid code? again, you know, they still have access to those grids that are there. Mm -hmm. They'll have access to their specific videos where they can choose if they wanted to download their video to use maybe for a portfolio somewhere else. Um, you know, I know a lot of schools have capstone either projects 
or portfolios that students have to create over time. This is an easy way where kids don't have to go backtrack. It's all right there for them to have access. So yes, that's another great benefit to use the school email domain because all of those videos are going to be tied to that student's um, email domain. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot too. So it used to be that when, when somebody asked me this question, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I'd have to say, and my answer doesn't entirely change, but I used to say, well, it depends on what exactly you're trying to achieve with the video. Like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get student responses or are they creating videos, which is kind of what this, this uh, question implied, uh, how detailed are those videos they're creating? What kind of video are they creating? And Flipgrid used to just be my answer in two different ways. It was either a, if you just want a response from kids, maybe they're doing it, maybe they're creating a skit or something like that, or maybe they're just responding to a question, Flipgrid's a great tool. Or if you want to create it somewhere else and then catalog it somewhere, they can upload it to Flipgrid. But now, like you said, now that you guys have added so many features to that camera, so much creativity tools, now Flipgrid, you know, becomes a a kind of a bigger answer to this question because the students can do more in there. Um, But some other tools that I want to want to point out too, that that I think are also great here, because I like Number one, we think about what exactly we're trying to achieve. And number two, we've got to think about it from our personal lens as a teacher. Like, what is our style? What are what technology do we have in the room? What is our content area? What are our kids like? And then select the best tool based on it. So some other tools that are there along, you know, alongside Flipgrid. If you're just trying to do kind of the basics of like screencasting and things like that, Screencastify is still a great tool. There are some other ones out there like Loom or Screencast-O-Matic uh, that are also good good choices to use in that situation. I know some schools use, I'm blanking on the name of this fourth one. My kid's school uses it. Nimbus. Nimbus. Have you heard of Nimbus? Oh, no, I haven't. No, but whatever one meets you, you know your needs as a school system is a, is a great tool to use. If you're trying to actually have students create videos, while, while Flipgrid does have some good stuff for that, the Adobe Spark platform is, a, is an amazing, easy to use flat platform for students to uh, take some, some pre-existing video and pictures and text and things like that and kind of automatically turn it into a video. It doesn't involve students really deeply in the video creation process. It's like they're not going in and selecting transitions and, and splicing the other video themselves. Adobe kind of does it automatically for them, which is really nice. But then if you really want them to get involved in the true video making process, uh, WeVideo is a great tool for that. If you're on iPads, uh, Doink is a great tool for that. Obviously, if you're in an Apple ecosystem, there's iMovie. Uh, but one of the important parts of this question here was the 13 year old part. And as you mentioned, it's different ages at different in different states and countries and things like that. But 13 tends to be the age we go back to um, because of COPA law. So COPA uh, is the children's online privacy protection act. It identified a, a child as, as being a person under the age of 13. Uh, and it's a privacy policy for those students. And, and basically COPA outlines when parent or guardian consent has to be given to use a tool. Generally in school districts, it seems like the school's policies and the things that this, the parents are signing off on kind of give the school the right to use whatever tool they deem appropriate. So it is, the school has to take their own steps to do it. But but thinking about those tools, so you said with Flipgrid that you don't have to have an account and there's there doesn't have to be any student-connected information used in there. They could just be using it via a code or a ID that you generate as the teacher or they could be using that school account. So obviously that function's okay for under 13. Absolutely. Yeah. And and then uh, Adobe Spark also, uh, you know, I- identifies that 13 year. So as they say, uh, children under, the, this is coming directly out of their, um, their guide, children under the age of 13 are not allowed to create their own Adobe ID. And so they will need to sign in with an account created by and supervised by a teacher or a parent. So right there, Adobe is saying if they're under the age of 13, they could still use it. They just have to have the account created by a teacher. So that works as long as your school is signed off on it. And they do say, um, else, elsewhere in their documentation that, that they are working with COPA law too on that. We, we video similarly um, directly out of their, their policy. It says um, in compliance with the, with COPA, the services are not intended for use if you are under 13 years of age, unless one of the following is true. And it says, number one, you're part of a we video education plan or two, you have the consent of your parent or legal guardian or three, you're using it as a guest user. So all of these tools that we're talking about here, as long as you're using it in the right way is fine for those under 13 year olds. And that's including Flipgrid. 
and and really it, it comes back to what are you trying to have the kids create here you know are they just responding are they creating something small how, how much time do you want them to put into it but you, you can't really go wrong with these tools you just got to pick what works best for you and your and your classroom and your students and your content and what you're trying to achieve you know absolutely yeah okay so now let, let's let's stick kind of with the topic of video well, video might be an answer for this next one but i think you, you have you have a question for us to follow up on here too so my question is how can you involve the entire learning community beyond just the four walls of your classroom? Yeah, so there are there are a lot of different tools out there that could do this, and some do it in different ways than others. Some do it better than others. One tool I've been kind of geeking out about lately is Seesaw, and Seesaw get, gets pigeonholed as being an elementary only tool, but it really works across all uh, age levels. And what Seesaw is really great at is putting the students, giving the students ownership of curating like proof of their own learning, and the students can really easily post to to what it calls I think it calls like a journal. They could post pictures or videos or text or files that they created in class to show that they understand something. And then there's really easy connections to parents or and teachers through there and messaging back and forth between parents and teachers. So it's a really great way to involve that community, that whole community of the parent, the teacher, and any other teachers that might be involved in that student's learning experience and the student. So I, I like Seesaw for that. What do you think? Well, you know, of course, I'm going to go with Flipgrid again. Uh, yep. And so I absolutely um, have been loving all of the tweets I've been seeing with parent teacher nights, family um, experiences with Flipgrid, um, and then students actually connecting with other classrooms around the world. Because the way I see a learning community, it shouldn't just be the students that's in your classroom. Now with technology, the classroom is the world. And so one thing that's really nice with Flipgrid, and, and it's in right in your educator admin in the tab, we have something called Grid Pals. Mm -hmm. And my dear friend, Bonnie McClellan, she had this vision of being able to have a digital pen pal and make it all happen with inside of Flipgrid. And so what she started was a Google um, form in which she physically paired educators together and they were able to start sharing those topics. And so with her vision and of course, with the innovation that happens inside of a technology company, when that idea is sparked by an educator, we were able to create what's called Grid Pals. And so now when you go to that Grid Pals tab, you can actually search that Grid Pals tab in various ways. Um, and what I love about that is if I'm looking specifically for, let's say, a class in Argentina, I can look based on location or I can search the grade level that I'm looking for in the subject area that I'm also looking for. Yeah. Um, and so that way, educators make a connection just by searching the map. And through your Flipgrid profile, you add in all of your social profile links to various um I guess social media apps. So whether it's Twitter or Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. LinkedIn, pretty much everything, um, or even email. So, you know, I know a lot of educators may separate their social media from things that they do in the education world. Right. So we also have the option to send an email invite. That email does not expose your email to anyone. Um, a message is sent to that educator through our platform and they can determine um, to send a message back to make that connection with the other educator who's looking to connect. And so uh, we've seen so much happen with these students connecting all around the world. And just last week, we had our Microsoft um, Global Connection, which if you are familiar with Skypeathon, uh, Skypeathon used to only happen on Skype. But what we've learned over time is that, you know, it's difficult to be able to have kids 
that are across the world connecting at the same time through synchronous video. So now with asynchronous video, we have the Microsoft Global Learning Connection, which still includes Skype, but now students can connect through Teams. They also can connect through Flipgrid. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was great to be able to celebrate this November 5th and 6th uh, for 48 hours, just celebrating the way students are connecting with their peers around the world. Um, In addition to Grid Pals, we love when students uh, and and teachers connect with family and community members. Many of them are choosing to use Flipgrid AR to be able to connect Um, with Flipgrid AR. Oh, my goodness. I am blown away every day by going to Twitter, searching the hashtag Flipgrid AR and seeing the student projects come to life. You know, as an educator, yeah. I always had work displayed. There was inside the classroom or out in the hallway or sent home or as part of a, a science uh, fair, et cetera. You know, we want to be able to celebrate and showcase mm-hmm. the work of our students. But, you know, with that document or with the artwork, there's only one dimension to it. But with Flipgrid AR, when students are creating their videos and teachers are adding those QR codes to that work, that student's video pops right off from that artwork or writing or whatever it is and adds this special element that makes you connect even more with the work. Oh, yeah. And it's very touching. It it, yeah. it humanizes, in a sense, the work. And granted, by far, this has been mm-hmm. probably the best thing I've ever seen. Uh, I want to go back to my second grade classroom that I started in yeah. in Louisiana yeah. and have those same kids in the in my class to be able to do this because it it also provides that sense of motivation. Mm-hmm. It, it gives an authentic audience, right? Mm-hmm. So so your authentic audience is not the wall. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it's the person who's going to read it and connect with it. And so it provides that opportunity to have that authentic audience, whether it's a family member or someone visiting the school, you know, it it's mind blowing. Yeah. And I, I'm so thankful that educators have uh, embraced it so much and are thinking about so many innovative ways that they can utilize Flipgrid AR to transform their learning experiences. Yeah. You know, being able to see the student video play on top of that student work just brings a very special element to families. I truly believe it, it brings families closer together, but also Um, addresses, I know one issue that I know the schools I was always in talked about, and that was family involvement. How, how can we get families involved? And so this way, you know, families don't have to physically be able to come to the school because that's always a challenge. But when you send something home with that code, you invite those families into that classroom learning environment. And to be able to see the work that their children are doing every single day. That's one way that we can involve our entire learning community um, with our students. And I I mentioned guest mode a little earlier. So you can still invite families and other special guests to participate in classroom discussions. But uh, by far, Flipgrid AR has um, just kind of blown my mind in the ways that educators are using uh, that to be able to share, celebrate, and showcase their students. As my friend Ann always says, share, celebrate, and showcase. Let's do it every single day. Nice. Yeah, I, the, so Flipgrid AR, I, I always think of my, my kids' uh, elementary school, they have an art 
show or I don't know, like art night or something every, every spring. And the entire building, all of the hallway walls are covered in student art projects. And you just go through and walk and the kids show their parents their artwork. But uh, you know, it, it, the art is there and the kid explains it to, to me. So, so what if my kid is not with me? You know, I could use that AR code, you know, that Q, well, it's a QR code that brings up an AR experience to be able to see that, you know, my, my kiddo explaining that work. And then the other level here, which you kind of alluded to there is what if we can't go? Like, wh- what if we have something going on that night and we can't show up to the, the art show? Or what if I'm out of town that night? Well, I can access those videos online using the code and see my my son or my daughter or my, my other son uh, explaining their artwork in video and telling me about what it was they were making there. And then like so many other possibilities of using the AR in those situations have been brought up. Like you said earlier, like just search that hashtag on Twitter and you, you know, you'll be amazed by all the things people are using Flipgrid AR for. Absolutely. It levels that family experience, you know, yeah. and every family is different and every family has different challenges, but every family has the right to be involved in their child's education. And, you know, we have to be able to provide those opportunities for families to be able to do so. And I think this is a great way um, to be able to to keep families informed um, and also have families just feel so um, special and elated that their children are doing the best that they can, you know, during the hours that they're at school because they're right. at school longer than what they're at home during the week, you know? Right. So, um, at least waking hours. So yeah, I think it's it's incredible opportunity to kind of defy the possibilities that right. before, you know, we were bound by time and space before and now right. we're not. Right. Well, yeah, when I pick my kids up from school in the afternoon and we're riding home, I ask them about their day and they tell me, uh, all about recess and all about what happened in the cafeteria. And they tell me all about PE that day, if it was a PE day. And then I'm like, okay, and what did you learn? And they're like, uh, right. And they can't, they can't like think of what to tell me about from, from all their classes. Like there was just so much that happened. Like they can't, they can't think of it, but with tools like Flipgrid or Seesaw, like I mentioned, this, the kids can be preparing those videos the student or the parents can then watch and actually see them because I can't pester the teacher every day and say hey what'd they do today in class the student instead can be sharing those videos with me and I could hear all about it yeah Yeah. and you know I'm glad you even mentioned that question like what did you do today you know because that was that's a question I ask my kids all the time as well but um one thing I used to do with my uh well I still do it with my daughters is we would read a Wonderopolis wonder um, every night, they are highly engaging, um, just quick articles, which are really fun. We all learn something. And then there's really cool try it out activities um, for me to be able to do like with my uh, children. Mm-hmm. And so um, with our partnership now with Wonderopolis, they have added um, their awesome articles as topics in the disco library. Right. And so Disco Library is a great place where educators can find their next topic to easily add to their grid. So if schools are also looking for a way to involve families just in a family learning moments, you know, um, maybe not do like 10 pages of homework, but maybe it's an opportunity yeah. for families to spend time together yeah. and they can they can create a grid as a, a like a family learning grid and they can add these topics from Wonderopolis or maybe some of the other partners or even teachers that have added um, topics to the disco library for families to um, engage in. So whether it's families reading books together or doing a fun experiment together or maybe going on a flip hunt in their own home looking for, you know, um, two dimensional objects or finding the perimeter of certain things in their home. You know, that's a great way to kind of bring learning to life in the home and also let it be authentic um, for the students. So there's so many different possibilities. You know, I I always say, you know, if you can think it, you can flip grid it. (laughs) I just want educators to know, you know, the limitations only live in your mind, you know, with, with Flipgrid and with any tool, um, really the possibilities are endless, you know, think outside the box, try some things out and also communicate with us. Because if you do find that limit or you don't know which tool to app smash to kind of make something happen, you know, we try on our end, 
the best to our ability to be able to meet those needs of educators. So yeah, we're all in this together, better together. Yeah. And so I absolutely uh, have loved this conversation, Jake. Yeah. I think you've put some new ideas in my mind as well. <laughs> yeah, same to you. I'm glad. I'm glad you brought up on that last one, the Disco Library. That's that's a huge tool for educators to check out. So I'm going to put a link uh, in the show notes about it. And the Disco, just so people know, it doesn't stand for Disco Tech or Disco Music. It stands for Disco Like Discovery. Even though you guys have have often used the use the guy the disco dancing emoji along with uh, yeah emoji along with that one but a great place to see those, those different ideas for teachers to use in their classroom and then uh you kind of alluded to it there's also virtual field trips in flipgrid there too so when we talk about you know the entire learning community you know there's the three main groups we normally talk about that's the teacher the student and the family but then there's also this fourth group which are which are other experts outside of the classroom and you know, grid pals are great for that. And, and virtual field trips through, through Flipgrid are great for that too. W- one thing that was always a barrier uh, in my classes when I would try to do like Skypes or Google Hangouts with professionals out there sometimes could be time zones and things like that. Or, yeah. or, you know, I teach this class four times a day and the scientist is like, well, yeah, I could do a connection one time, but we could use some of these tools that are asynchronous, like you mentioned, to create those connections using using a grid. And like you said, that scientist doesn't have to have a Microsoft or Google account. I could just give them a code uh, and they could respond to students' questions or or make a video and students can ask them questions and things like that uh, right there in, in a tool like Flipgrid. Right. And so with Flipgrid, we actually have our very own virtual field trip opportunity um, to Flipgrid Studios. So if you don't live in Minneapolis and you can't you know, come to our office and take a field trip, you can sign up for the virtual field trip to Flipgrid Studios. And so uh, these happen every month. You would basically go to blog.flipgrid.com slash field trip to find out the next day and time. Um, And we try to vary the times because this is a synchronous opportunity for our our community. And um, you basically just register. We send you a link to join and um, we answer students' questions, take them on a tour of Flipgrid Studios. They get to meet some of the team members. And we always try to record those. So for those who are unable to, you know, attend live for those virtual field trips, depending on the the time frame, we do record them and link them to that blog post as well. So definitely, we would love to meet students all around the world. So please join us for our next virtual field trip. Yeah, so I've got that link in the show notes there, so people can check that out. So now that now that they've they've heard Jornay and they're like, I want to know more about about life at Flipgrid because she's making it sound so awesome. I want to see her pulling into work in her monster truck. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can sign up for a virtual field trip to see all that stuff. So thank thank you so much, Jornay, for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been a blast, and I'm all yeah. about duct tape, right, and using <laughs> things in the, in the right manner for whatever purposes that we need it for. And so I, I've absolutely loved this conversation. It's left me with more ideas to try to implement. And to all the educators that are listening out there, number one, thank you for everything you do every single day to just empower your students to achieve more um, and and give them the best opportunities. And just note that Team Flipgrid is here to support you. So please reach out to us at any time. Uh, Jake has added my email to um, the show notes, but also, you know, you can send us a message at hello at flipgrid.com and we will connect with you and respond to you. So thank you so very much for what you do. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jornay, for being with us today. You guys are doing some awesome things over there at Flipgrid. We appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Shake. Oh, what a great chat with Jornay. She had so much good stuff to share. I know that Flipgrid dominated the conversation, but let's be honest, guys, it almost always dominates the conversation here on Educational Duct Tape Podcast. And as you guys know, the message is you find technologies that work with your students and with your style and with your content. If it's not Flipgrid, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's Flipgrid all the time, there's nothing wrong with that either. I want to shine a spotlight on things that I think help you guys and 
I think Flipgrid is helpful for many of you. And as you could tell from my chat with Jornay, she is a passionate educator who cares a lot about education. And it's likewise with the rest of the Flipgrid team. So we do appreciate Jornay coming on and sharing all of those updates. But now, speaking of updates, it's time for the duct tapers to update us on some of the things that they have to share. So first up, an Apple podcast review for the episode comes from Al Brown 97 The review was titled New Listener, and it says, Just discovered this podcast. What a great resource for hearing about different types and ways ways to use technology as a tool to achieve educational goals. Thank you so much for sharing that, Al. I really do appreciate it when I see those Apple Podcast reviews out there. They make me smile. They make me happy. So if you want me to be happy, help me out with a review out there. But it also, more importantly, helps other people discover the show and become a duct taper and indirectly benefits students as well. Let's now see what's going on on the educational duct tape flip grid grid with a uh, post from Joshua Huff. Hey there, duct tapers. First of all, I just want to say thank you to Jake and the duct tape community. Um, I kind of feel like a rock star knowing that the question that I asked was actually, you know, the the basis of, of the entire episode 18 with Pam uh, Hubbler, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, it was wonderful to hear that some people had the same uh, reactions that I did and other people had answers to that at the same time. Um, this is why I partake in this community is just because it, it's overwhelming the amount of support that you get and the amount of people that you can reach. Um, with the internet. So first of all, I just want to give an update. I, I, to try and get the kids motivated, my main problem was they did not really want to hear their voice or see themselves on the screen. Um, so what I ended up doing was I ended up using Adobe Spark to have them create videos of solving the equations by using screenshots and text and the, and the, uh, video features that are available in Adobe Spark. So that way I had different options. I had some kids that wanted to do screencasting and didn't mind hearing their voice or seeing themselves on the webcam. And then if they didn't want to do that, they felt more comfortable using the Adobe Spark. Now, the Adobe Spark was more work. Um, However, um, after going through and viewing them all, after I had them upload, I had the class upload them to a Padlet um, so they could all view them and comment on each other's work and collaborate. Uh, after viewing them, I kind of noticed that the Adobe Spark ones tended to ben, be more entertaining than those students that were just doing the screencastify of them solving, explaining, solving the equation on Google Keep. So, you know, it kind of turned out to be a good thing. Um, you know, I did a little differentiation for students. And like I said, to be honest, the Adobe Spark tended to be uh, more attention grabbing and kids tended to like those more. So they actually ended up putting in a little bit more effort. So again, thank you everybody for your help. Um, again, honored to know that you know hundreds of people are listening to Jake's podcast, and it was a question that I had posed. Um, so thank you again, and I'll update you more as I go along with this. Thank you for that, Joshua. So as you can tell from that message, we covered a question of Joshua's back in episode 18 with Pam Hubler. And we discussed what Joshua was was wondering about, which was an issue where he was giving uh, students what he thought was a super exciting project to do, where they were, I think, using Screencastify to record themselves answering a math question uh, by writing in Google Keep. And the students weren't as excited about it as he was. And so we posed some possible suggestions. And it sounds like what he ended up doing was offering the kids some choice and giving them a few different options. And it created some excitement once they had some choice. So that's great to hear. And it's great to hear his reflections on how much the kids enjoyed using Adobe Spark and how entertaining the videos ended up being. So Joshua, thank you for reaching back out and sharing that with us. And to the rest of you, I'm always up for questions. You could post them in that Flipgrid grid and they might potentially become a question that I ask a guest on a future episode. Let's hop over to the Twitter sphere now and see what some of my favorite hashtag EDU duct tape tweets of the week were or tweets of the fortnight. I keep messing that up, guys. It's been two weeks, not one week. It's a fortnight. Night. <laughs> so our first tweet comes from at Mr. Oris Tech, one of the early uh, guests from the Educational Duct Tape podcast. And he said, what in the world is at Jake Miller Tech doing? Listen into this week's hashtag EDU Duct Tape podcast with at Dave underscore Turnet on STEM, AR, VR, CAD, and more. And it's a retweet of uh, an old, old, old tweet from about three years ago when I visited Dave Turnet episode 30 guest and tried out, I, th- I believe I was wearing the Oculus Rift. No, no, no. I think that was a HoloLens in that video. Uh, 
uh, so it's a video of me playing some weird game where it looked like little robot mice were coming in the wall. So Alex was kind enough to retweet that out there to make sure that that video got back into circulation there. Thanks for that, Alex. Next up, at Amy J. Huckabee said, at Jake Miller Tech, I'm listening right now and must mention that highfalutin is my number one favorite English word. Now I'm turn- tuning back in to see if I hear my favorite French word, parapluie. I don't know how to say it, but it means umbrella in, in French, apparently. That, that's me adding that in, Amy. I, I, Amy, of course, knows how to say it. It's her favorite French word. French word. I, I, however, don't. And I had to look up the fact that it meant uh, umbrella. But yes, Dave Turnett likes to say highfalutin. So if you hang out with Dave much, you'll hear that a lot. And you did get to hear it back in episode 30 of the podcast. Next up, at Math Wits says, I'm just now discovering and binging, hashtag EDU duct tape. Listen to episode one through six. When at Jake Miller Tech reads the Twitter followers, it feels like some grown-up version of Romper Room. I'm reading this partially because... I love this part of the podcast being referred to as Romper Room, but really, it's not just because of that, because we've already talked about this Romper Room comparison before. I just am kind of geeking out about the parallel universe where at Math Wits finally listens to this episode like five months from now when they catch up with all of the episodes of the podcast and they hear their call out here. It's going to be like like crazy, like... um, Twilight Zone kind of stuff. And finally, our friend Mo Physics at Mo underscore physics. Uh, and in an answer to the uh, Twitter question last week in the chat said, Mike here, I'm a science teacher from Wisconsin. I have no problem using your finger as a toothbrush if I must. So Mike was referring to the question that I asked Dave in last week's episode, where I asked Dave, which would be less torturous wearing someone else's underwear or using someone else's toothbrush. And Mike meant to say in his Twitter answer here that he would just use his finger as a toothbrush, but he actually said, I have no problem using your finger as a toothbrush. (laughs) I think that is a winning tweet right there, Mike. Now let's hop back over to the educational duct tape flip grid grid and see what our friend Angela Green had to share back at the beginning of September when she left us this message. Hi, this is Angela Green from Tecumseh Local Schools, and I am looking rough because I have spent the entire weekend, Labor Day weekend, reading this book, Tech with Heart by Stacey Roshan. In fact, not only did I read and annotate and highlight and take notes on this book, I also created a Flipgrid grid topic and shared my reflections on each chapter. Now, if I can't put a link to that Flipgrid in the comments below, which I don't think I can, here is that link. It is flipgrid.com forward slash 7E77E3D9. So go on over to the grid and check out some of my reflections and feel free to add your own. Um, and Stacy, if you're watching, I hope you also check out the, the Flipgrid topic and, and chime in because I thought the book was amazing. Um, in fact, I think you should have Stacy Roshan on the educational podcast again because she has a lot of interesting things to say. And I've also decided that I will never be a guest on the educational duct tape podcast because I don't have anything interesting to say compared to what you will read in this book. This book is awesome. I think it should be required reading. It is about flipping your classroom, but even if you can't or are not in a position to flip your classroom, you will learn how to bring a higher level of compassion to your teaching. This book should be required reading for all of us. Thanks, Stacy, And thanks, Jake. Thank you for that, Angela. You're getting me excited for reading Tech with Heart. It's on my bookshelf. It's actually next up after I finish the last few chapters of the book that I'm currently in right now. And then Tech with Heart is next. So I'm eager to get started on it. And when I get started on it, I will be checking out that flip grid that you shared there. For the rest of you that are trying to feverishly write down all those sevens and E's that Angela shared there, it is in the show notes. So if you've read Tech with Heart, it's really cool how she has one video per chapter. So then you can go back in and respond to her videos if you want to, which I will totally do, Angela, as I start reading it. Uh, also, Angela, thank you for suggesting that I have Stacy on the show again at some point in the future because I totally don't have enough people in my list to potentially have his guests again. So now I need you to tell me to have Stacy on three months later. Come on, Angela. There are so many awesome educators in my list. I feel like I can't keep up with all the awesome people I want to have on the show. And Angela, you are on the list because you have plenty of interesting things to say. Speaking of interesting things to say, and not from Angela, but from other people, let's see who our new hashtag ED you duct tape tweeps of the week are. I've got to tell you, I'm cheating a little bit here because some of these tweeps are from when I spoke at hashtag my Google and at hashtag teach better 19, but whatever they're tweeting about the educational duct tape framework and idea, whether it's directly about the podcast or not, I'm excited to have these people 
uh, in the community. Some of them are tweeting about the podcast. Some were from me speaking about educational duct tape. But regardless, they're they're duct tapers now. They're with us. So welcome in at Blue Tanzo at CSO618, at Daniel T. Mares, at David J. Lockett, at Don Shea underscore Teach, at Heneld underscore EDU, at Jesus H1979, at JR Berlin58, at Keely Bar, at Cool Teacher at Math Wits, at Mish Google, at Miss Galang, at Miss Camp Teaches, at MJ Hankins 4, at Mr. Markovich, at Mrs. Jackson E-L-A-R, at Nearpod, at P House EDU, at R Bathurst Hunt, at Shake Up Learning, the Shake Up Learning, yes, that's her, at Stephen underscore Colber, at Teach Lawrence, at Teach the Tech, and at Irby. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to about 495 people who have tweeted with the hashtag EDU duct tape, not including me and not including retweets or modified tweets, 495 separate accounts. So by the time I talk to you one fortnight from now, we will have broken 500. And that just makes me so happy, you guys. But that is the end of the episode. So so don't forget to join us next week on Wednesday evening for the hashtag EDU duct tape chat. Don't forget to subscribe so that next week when that short little episode of a live recorded interview with Adam Welcome comes out, you get it in your feed. Don't forget to go to eduducttape.com slash certificate and ent- enter the super secret code from today's episode to get your certificate sent to you. If it doesn't work right or if you have any feedback on the process, please email me back. Don't forget to head over to bit.ly slash Jacob learning if you're interested in any of Casey Bell's Shake Up Learning Google courses. Uh, don't forget to review the show on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to tell a friend. Don't forget to go over to flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape and uh, submit a message to be on the show. Don't forget to join the duct tape Facebook group. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter. Don't forget to be nice to yourself. Don't forget to look both ways before you cross the road. Don't forget to buckle your seatbelt. Don't forget to say bye to people when you're walking away from them so that you seem polite. Don't forget to brush your teeth in the morning and in the evening. I, I am just rambling. I'm going to go ahead and stop now. Have a great night. Have a great day. Have a great whatever time it is. And I will see you in a fortnight. Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please visit eduducttape.com to join the discussion, share possible topics, inquire about being a guest, or contact Jake. And remember, duct is spelled with a T, not a quack quack cake.